Hey, following on the previous episode, I think I've managed to gather a fairly fair mix of good and bad today. So let's not waste any more time and check them out together. Son of the Sun is a sci-fi post-apocalyptic point-and-click adventure game. In the far off future, after a series of nuclear disasters that devastated Earth and knocked it off of its original location into orbit much closer to the Sun, the atmosphere on the planet has changed considerably. Once blue and green marble is now predominantly in shades of yellow and orange and in grand majority a sandy barren wasteland devoid of life. Humanity seems to be doomed and on the verge of extinction. Until until the discovery of the metal or morium that seems to be able to protect against the sun's heat and radiation. The gimmick is, the earth has so little time left that to be able to save it, the ore has to be tested directly on the sun. You play as James Mariner, a test pilot who has been chosen to pilot the Firefly, an experimental craft plated with the new material and modified to be the test subject and also deploy the probe within the sun's corona and monitor the results. Naturally, if things went great, we'd not have a game to play. So, as you go about your oh-so-important mission, you find yourself meeting a strange alien civilization and face what they left behind. Generally speaking, Sign of the Sun is a typical point-and-click adventure that's mainly focusing on the inventory puzzling. Unlike most games in the genre though, it features quite a few action sequences, many of them being combat-oriented. Which is its biggest issue too, cause not only they are rather clunky, but the controls for fighting are some of the worst you've seen, mainly utilizing numeric keyboard so you never really feel comfortable trying to pull off any of the attack or defensive moves. These action sequences are not only not the best, but also one of them is hard-baked at the very beginning of the game, effectively detracting most of its potential gamers with its shoddy design from playing. What I personally dislike about Signs of the Sun the most, however, are the graphics, namely pre-rendered characters turned into sprites. I didn't like it in Donkey Kong Country, an arguably much better game, even if in an entirely different genre, and I most definitely don't like it here. It's the worst aging kind of 2D graphics. Salas Quest is a very simple platformer and a title that's more similar to the arcade games of the year than any in its own genre. It's an overly simplistic in its design game, clearly aimed at younger audiences. I don't think that there's any real story behind it, at least none that I would know of, but it doesn't really need to have one, because all you have to do in each of the levels is kill all the enemies by jumping on their heads. You know, like Mario, or a psychopath. I mean, perhaps he was one too, we have no way of knowing today, he's ancient now. All we know for a fact is that same as Silas Quest's protagonist, that is bottom heavy blob without arms I must add, he loved jumping on cute creatures' heads. Still, if you clear the stage of all of them, the game enters a 60 seconds long bonus section in which you must collect as many stars as you can for points. And that's it. No, really, there's no special stages, no bonuses and no real ending. You go through all the levels and then the game ends. Well, truth be told, you don't go through all the stages as they're beyond boring and repetitive after your third or fourth, but if you would, you'd see nothing new all throughout. Silas Quest released in 1997 and by then even it was already outdated in everything sounds, graphics, animation and most of all gameplay design. While the graphics are not bad per se, they're workable at best, the animations are smooth, but the controls and character movement especially feel unpleasantly floaty. So, to summarize, if you're a hardcore fan of platformers and have to play them all, then yeah, this one's not broken at all, just not very fun, and you may check it out. But if you're not, then skip it. Yeah, it's not very good. Silent Shadow is an arcade shoot'em up that originated on C64 in 1988 and was ported to PC three years later, virtually unchanged. The game is supposedly set in the Persian Gulf, and you must go through four unique stages of enemy airbase, city, desert and sea to complete it, with the ultimate goal being destruction of the enemy fleet. Your fighter is state-of-the-art machine for the make-believe 1988 and you naturally have to dispose of any and all enemies coming your way, regardless of how many it might be. And it will be a lot, trust me. You don't really get to find and use any power-ups and the weapon you start with is the weapon you'll end with, so it's more of a skill-based shooter than one relying on progressive upgrades to carry on which has its up and downsides. You do get smart bombs clearing the screen of all enemies though, which is always fun, but I suggest keeping those for when you've no other choice, as means of last resort of survival, so to speak. If you look at the Silent Shadow and think that it looks a bit 8-bit-ish, then you're right. It feels like it too. 
and not much has changed from the original. The gameplay hasn't been improved, you can still enjoy it in two player mode and the graphics are only really upgraded in terms of the resolution, not featuring any considerable bumps in their quality, which given the game's origin I can't understand, but I'd love one change to be made to it. Instead of keeping the gameplay window constrained to a hair thin vertical strip, it would be cool if it was remade to cover the whole screen. What I'd like and what's reality are two different things though, best proof of that is the fact that I still have to go to my day job, which I hate with a passion of a thousand dead poets, and are not traveling multi-millionaire. Still, the game would benefit from a larger play area. Silent Shadow is definitely not great, but it's decent and most of all very charming, so if you're someone who appreciates shooters, you'll no doubt at the very least like it. Silly Rabbit Tricks Are For Kids Silly Night Makeups For Chicks I really don't know where I was going with it, other than the bottomless well of cringe. Anyway, Silly Night is an interesting title and one definitely worth a look. So if you're gonna pick just one game out of this whole video, this should be the one. It's a medieval themed action platformer that released in 2017 as freeware, being created as an entry for a DOS game creation competition. There's hardly any story behind it, you're a, well, a silly knight, and you're lost in a maze like a enormous castle. Your goal is to find your way through its medieval moss-covered bowels to get to the throne room, all to grab the throne and become your next step transformation a la Frieza from Dragon Ball Z, so a silly king. I presume, I have no facts to support this claim. You're armed with a sword only initially and have to explore the castle fighting your way through dozens of deadly creatures. So bats, skeletons and evil red knights among others. If that was all however, given your skills and a superhero status, you'd complete the game in no time. Probably before I finish talking about it. But there are also traps, quite a few of them in fact, so you have to parkour your way around them to survive too. There's no lives in the game, but you can save it at numerous spots by lighting fires at specific locations, which will from then onward serve as respawn points. As most castles, this one too will require quite a lot of environmental puzzling, so you'll need to find keys to be able to progress through locked off areas. It's nothing you've not done before, so shouldn't be an issue really. There are also health bonuses replenishing your life energy and power-ups, so finding these should be a priority. Interestingly enough, while only sporting PC speaker sounds, Silly Knight uses undocumented CGA display mode, which apparently is a subset of a text mode allowing for display of graphics and sprites in 160 by 100 in 16 colors. I'm no expert on CGA or any other GA really, so I may be wrong here, but that's what I was able to find about it, and it seems like a fun little factoid. Being a modern and not retro title, Silly Knight theoretically should have no place in this video, but the channel's called All The New Video Games, and it's a DOS game in CGA, so I feel that Silly Knight fits in perfectly. Scenaria Lost in Space is a sci-fi themed metroidvania action platformer. The world of Scenaria is in danger. Yep, again. I mean, again something is in danger and you have to step in, not Scenaria again. We've not spoke about it before. So yeah, it's in danger and the evil Stomper and his minions are threatening it. The destruction is inevitable it seems. But wait a minute, we've got you, right? You are free this afternoon, am I correct? Great. So, um, how about you go and deal with it? Please and thank you. I knew you'd say yes and not fail the innocent citizens of Scenaria. You are the best. And if by any chance you said no, please know that you are forever dead to me and blocked from this channel. I mean, I have no way of confirming who did or did not say it, so I'm just gonna block 100 of you on random. Or am I? Anyway, the game world is rather large and interestingly designed, featuring a surprising number of hidden passages and locations. An add-on in the form of X-ray vision allows you to discover them all. And generally speaking, you should get used to the idea of tools, as you'll need to find and use quite a few different ones, to solve bits and pieces of environmental puzzling all throughout the game. So, Saturn Ball, for instance, allows you to transform into a ball and squeeze through small passages. Jump Boots, as you might have guessed going by the creative naming alone, increases your jump's reach. And Swivel lets you grapple onto special blocks and swing over obstacles. Scenario Lost in Space released as a shareware and was planned as a two-parter, with return of Stomper meaning to drop a little after. Sales, popularity or lack thereof of either must have been a factor that prevented the second game from coming out. Today, so many years later, the reason is irrelevant. What is though, is that Scenario is genuinely a really fun game to get lost in, with a lot of cool mechanics, little secrets and addictive gameplay. If Silly Knight was not something down your alley, check Scenario out, as it's as good. I loved CinemaWare games. 
They were often of different genres and themes, sure, but always had one thing in common. A very cinematic movie-like design, full of minigames and uniquely playing out scenes. And hardly ever anything on the market could compare to them in quality of presentation and gameplay ideas. Sinbad and the Throne of the Falcon may not be their best, but it's definitely a very good game. Especially compared to what was available on PC at the time. You play as Sinbad, the sailor from 1001 Arabian Nights, roaming seas in search for the riches, power and true love. The game starts with you playing as Sinbad, already being a well-known, nay, famous adventurer, and a close friend to Caliph's family. So, when the Princess Sylvani found her father turned into a falcon, you're the one who's called in to help. The most obvious suspect of the crime is one of Caliph's sons, Evil Black Prince, a name that truly says it all. And this is where the game starts. You have to find a way to return Caliph to his original form before the transformation becomes permanent and in the same time defend the capital against Black Prince's armies. If it falls, the game ends with a failure. The adventure will take you to different locations and will let you take part in many uniquely cinematically presented activities, like visiting Gypsy Sorceress for the magic charm, famous seductress, and not for what you think you'd want to meet with her. You'll sword fight numerous times with many opponents, you'll shoot at demonic birds, pteranoxos that serve the Black Prince, you'll sail dangerous waters avoiding sharp rocks and picking up shipwrecked sailors, you'll be raiding a cyclops' cave to save your crewmates, and you'll even encounter platforming sections with ladders among others. You won't get bored in Sinbad, is what I'm saying, and we'll have a lot of fun all throughout it. If you add to it a stellar for the time visual presentation, it's even more of an enchanting package to waste some hours in. The only thing that I could honestly complain about here is the sound design, namely use of a PC speaker only, as sadly it's the only option of hearing any beeps and boops while playing. When compared to Amiga, Atari ST or in case of sound even Commodore 64, PC may not look or sound especially competitive, but if you don't, compare that is, you won't feel as if you're missing anything and will have a blast. Scanning in the Wild West is an arcade action platformer, and a first of Scanning Games series of shareware titles released in the early to mid 90s that we'll cover today. Scanny, if you're wondering, is an anthropomorphic orange squirrel that's just a tiny bit more annoying than having already rather bad games Babsy. Scan is a protagonist in all his games, hence the title, and they're nearly always in completely different genres and of very varied quality, usually ranging between terrible and bad, with an occasional decent outlier. Wild West is not great. Scanny's mom sends him back in time into 1909 to recover the ship that had been stolen from the farm of his great-grandparents. So, armed with your trusted water pistol playing as the ginger rodent, you have to recover all the ship, all the while fighting off various enemies. Some can be permanently killed off, others respawn after a while. While being touched by the enemy, you only lose a portion of your life counter. Falling from the platform, most often than not, is an instant death. Along the way, other than the pistol, you'll get to grab hearts refilling your HP or crates that can be dropped anywhere to let you jump higher than you would have otherwise. Scanning in the Wild West is composed out of 10 incredibly boring ass levels, with only two of them available in the shareware version. Presentation wise, there's nothing here to amaze you, sounds are decent, but nothing special, they fit to what's on the screen. Which is good, cause graphics, while rather nice separately put together, look out of place. I don't know what to say about them, but they just don't seem to fit well together. And you know what? That's not it. I have two more scanning games to tell you about today. Scanny Lost in Space? Yes, it should have been. Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself here. It's a second game in the series in today's video and it's only marginally better than the last. It could be argued that no Scanny games were truly great and all were meat or meat adjacent, but at the very least this one's more arcade oriented, so has that pick up and play feeling to it that the former covered platformer didn't. Story-wise, and it's a pretty dumb story in this one, all of the TV satellite dishes have been stolen by the horde of schnoozes. Now, what schnoozes are, I don't know. Well, other than the villains of this game whose name sounds like something you may bring back from one of those visits to exotic countries if you go there unvaccinated against the local diseases. You know, one of those conditions that cause you to ooze green brownish colored goo from all the cavities in your body. Usually all at once. Yuck. Anyway, so the satellite dishes are gone, which in 1993 might have been the problem as people still watch TV, so the best of the best astronaut badasses we could find have been sent to the moon to recover them. As soon as they arrived, however, they've been captured and are now a subject of weird alien rituals of hopefully not an erotic nature. You're scanning hardnut, a hardnut to crack. 
and a super agent extraordinaire sent to the moon to do both, what previous parties sent their failed completing, and also to rescue them in the process. As you can see in the footage, Scanny Lost in Space is nothing more than a bit rework Moon Patrol clone. So you're going from left to right in each and every stage, killing ground and air enemies, avoiding numerous obstacles and collecting pickups. And this can be lives, health refills or extra ammo. Because yes, you don't die at a single hit but have a life counter, and ammo is limited. So while it's similar to aforementioned Moon Patrol, it's also considerably easier. Graphics are not bad in this one, they have this very strong early 90s shareware vibe, and while they may not be on the same level as those of commercial releases, I always found shareware presentation very charming in its crude simplicity. The game, same as the previous, is composed out of 10 levels, two of them in the shareware release, and as these trash scanning games go, this one's surprisingly not terrible and just meh. Scanny Desert Raid is the last game in the series that I'll be able to gather strength to talk about today, I promise, to you and myself. It's also a horizontally scrolling shoot em up that's kinda similar to Scramble, a much better original game I must add. You might have noticed a pattern already of every of those scanning games copying some other, older classic, bringing it to the early 90s quality of presentation and losing a lot of the original's playability in the process. And it kinda fits, as the company that made these unquestionable pieces of shovelware was called Copysoft. Yep, they've been brash enough to put it in their name. Anyway, Desert Raid is built out of six near-identical stages in which you're going from left to right in your biplane, shooting various ground and air enemies and rockets. I don't know why, but for whatever the reason, a huge chunk of the enemies is ground-based. Like most of them. And while you have unlimited shot, these ground-based ones can only be defeated using bombs, which you guessed it right, are obviously limited. What's worse, to complete the level, you have to bomb a final target at the end of it, so these bombs that you could use throughout the game are best saved up for the end level. Well, at least few of them, which effectively changes the character of Desert Raid from a crappy shoot em up into an even crappier dodge em up, because you're trying to navigate between dozens of shots coming away from below while saving the only weapon you could use efficiently against the Grand Asylums as much as you can. Whatever. Naturally, you can pick up additional bombs, health packs and very rarely screen clearing Super Bomb too, but given the onslaught of enemy shots, it's not that easy to do so. Same as the other two titles in the series that we've covered here today, Desert Raid lacks variety, lacks feeling of progress, controls are stiff and unresponsive, the fun factor is short-lived too, and replayability is virtually non-existent, cause you won't even like to complete it once, let alone replay it after. Slicks and Slides is one of the most fun you could have in a shareware multiplayer racing on PC in 1993, period. I should really end it here, shouldn't I? It would be more impactful. And yet, I carry on talking. It's a disease, help me. Anyway, Slicks and Slides is a top-down arcade racer. It features over 20 tracks and tons of different vehicles to racing, from motorbikes through regular cars to tanks and flying saucers among others, and a power-up system allowing you to upgrade your vehicle stats, so you know, handling, acceleration, speed and the likes. If that wasn't enough, you get to purchase and use missiles, mines, rifles, shotguns and others, supplementing your I'm sure master after first half an hour of playing near constant ramming of the opponent of their path. Shortcuts are present in most tracks and it's good to learn their best approach vectors fast as they will let you get a second or two ahead of the rest of the drivers. Look at me, talking about approach vectors, like some kind of a smart guy. Anyway, the most prominent thing about this whole slicks and slides ordeal most definitely is fast-paced, crazy and chaotic multiplayer action, preferably with all of you cramped at a single keyboard, elbowing each other as much as you try to push your friends' cars off the road. It's a barrel of laughs, trust me. Slicks and slides can be also played in single player, but doing so is a waste of a perfect party game, especially that all the tracks are devilishly fun designed, custom crafted to not only put your driving skills to the test, but also create tons of opportunities for all the cars to battle it out or seek out shortcuts, fighting between all of you for each fraction of a second as if there was no tomorrow. And it's nowhere near as cool if you're playing against always perfect driving and predictable CPU opponents. All I told you about is in the shareware version of the game. When you pull the trigger and pay for it, which you can funny enough do even today for a mere 5 bucks, you not 
not only get access to tons more tracks, but also an excellent track editor, which extends the life of this gem near indefinitely. Graphics and sounds may not be groundbreaking in any way, the first is clean and high color, and you never feel like you've lost view of your car in the background while pushing the proverbial pedal to the metal. And the second sounds fitting, and that's as much as we could hope for from a sound design in 1993's Sharer release. Oh, I failed to mention it before, but the controls take getting used to, so even if some corners keep sending you spinning initially, or you feel that they're a bit too sensitive, give them a minute, they will grow on you soon, and we feel like a second nature in no time. To summarize, if you have someone to play those classics with, then Slicks and Slides is amazing. But if you don't, it won't prove as addicting, I'm afraid. Quite a varied selection, don't you think? Some really interesting titles and a whole series of skunky-centric crap. I mean, they're bad, like really bad, but still worth learning about, even if not playing. What do you think, though? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.